allowing me to come here and speak and, and share, and also uh, spend some time with everyone. And I want to bring special attention to, to someone who I have known since 1972. Stand up for me. She was very good friends with my mother, Mrs. Deitch. I came from Germany in 1972, and she welcomed my mother, my siblings to the neighborhood. And here we are, full circle. God brought us back together Aww. by ch chance. It just happened. So here we are together. And I want to thank you for coming. I know you're here all the time, but it means so much more when I see somebody uh, from the past, especially somebody that was so nice to my mother all those Aww. years. <laughs> Let me just introduce my... Um, the rest of the family just showed up. <laughs> so this is my wife, Casey. You're going to hear what God did for me with... The wife he chose, not the wife that I chose. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear about that. This is my daughter, Crystal. Crystal, everybody needs to see your stomach. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal will be giving birth soon. She's pregnant. <laughs> this is her fiancé, Troy. <laughs> this is my little baby sister, with which Mrs. Deitch never got to meet. Stand up, Esther. Aww. So Esther was born just about the same time that we were leaving East Northport and heading to Comac. And this is Mrs. Deitch. <laughs> and then we have Peter. And I'm just going to say the twins because that's what everybody calls them. The twins. And where's Roddy? And Roddy, my brother-in-law, is right over there doing... And Sarah. And, and Sarah. Oh, I didn't, I, I'm not wearing my glasses again. <laughs> and then one other person would be Glenn, longtime friend, uh, filmmaker... Very famous for some of his films, and very good friend of my brother. So enough of that now. <laughs> I had that in my script, I had to say over. But let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Some of you know me. Some of you only kind of know me through my videos and maybe my podcast, maybe see me on different other formats. But um, I'm an optician by trade, life coach, an addiction recovery coach. Um, a host, been on a few different uh, TV shows, but most importantly, and something that only I had a choice in eliminating of being, and although I still am, but I'm recovering, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Ralph, like this ain't AA. Hi, I'm an alcoholic. With all those things said, the most important thing that I am is a child of God, which we all are. We're all children of God. Whether you realize this or not, but in every seed, I put a little seed to harvest in the future. And it's up to you for those seeds to harvest into whatever you wanted to harvest into. Now, the seed that was planted in me originally when I was born couldn't harvest. Because in order for a seed to, to really harvest, you need to give it water. And uh, so when I was born in Germany in 1961, came to America... <coughs> Went back to Germany to live with my grandparents. I, I found myself drinking at the age of two, three, and four. And this was not due to my choosing, and it, it was nothing against my family doing it, but my grandmother, my dad's mom, she had a little stand like this in a department store. Can I move this? Because I feel yes, like I have to look around here. Um, she had a little stand, and she had shots of liquor. In Germany, beer and alcohol is very common. And I was under here. She had to babysit me. <laughs> so she would hand me shots. Oh, um, my goodness. Now, a lot of people will say, well, listen, alcoholism is a choice, or a drug addiction can be a choice. But it's also genetics, and it's also a disease. So from that point on, I felt that I needed alcohol. But I did stop when I came to America in 1972. And then I started again as a teenager. The choice was there. I made that choice, but I also felt I needed it. And why did I need it? Because I was struggling with so many different issues in life. And, and there were issues that maybe some people would kind of throw under the rug and say, oh, you didn't have to struggle with it. But I did. And alcohol was my vice that I turned to each and every time. It made me feel good. It made me look at people differently. It gave me those beer muscles. And life was just totally different for me at that particular time. In 1979, I graduated Northwood High School, went up to Sullivan County Community College, continued all my drinking there. My GPA went down to 1.7, which is pretty bad, right? <laughs> I 
Uh, why? Because I was concentrating on alcohol and women. That was more important than school to me. I had a girlfriend in, in college who um, kind of dumped me. I don't know why. I mean, look at me. <laughs> so she dumped me, and I was walking through a mall in Middletown, New York, and this big Marine came up to me. And he took his white glove, and I remember that. He pointed in my face. He said, you want to be the few, the proud? And I was like, I had nothing else to lose at this point. So without even telling my parents, at first, I flew down to North Car uh, South Carolina, and I stood on these yellow footprints. It is then when God planted a seed already in me, because in boot camp, you either go with the flow or where things are going to happen differently for you. The selfish person that I was heard, wow, if you're a lay reader, you get Coke and you get to make phone calls. You know, you get Coca-Cola. And Anyone know what a lay reader is here? Yeah. A lay reader is a person that works with the chaplain. He is the immediate, he or she, well, in my case, it would be he because there weren't any ladies, Marines in boot camp with me. You're a mediator between the recruits that you're in the same squad with and the chaplain because there are lots of attempted suicides and things as such. So I said, well, I'm selfish. I'm going with the coke, and I'm going with those phone calls. So I became a lay reader, and I received a medal for doing that. But it's then when God planted a seed because he saw something in me and that was to help other people because that's what a lay reader does. He helps the people that have problems to bring it to the Lord. And that's what actually was going on. But from that point on, I always said, God, I got this. I don't need your help. I got this. I know my life. I just kept going with the drinking. Kept going. Got married. We spoke about, a second ago we spoke about... Uh, I picked my first wife, great woman, childhood friend, went to church with her, but it's not who God picked for me. And I truly believe that God has more to say about your life than you do, because I know for a fact we make decisions that aren't in our best interest, and it, and it probably wasn't in our best interest to marry me, <laughs> and that's what just happened. So at that point, um, we had a child, she's sitting there, old one now, 31. 31? Yeah. Now she's ready to have a baby. And uh, I just kept going with the drink, and it was getting worse and worse. And deep down inside, I just knew that I needed to, I needed to ex expand myself to, to, to follow what my mother instilled in me, and that's the Christianity part of it. But the alcohol was stronger because the alcohol was the devil. That's what the alcohol was. And you know what? A Bible didn't make me feel as good as the alcohol did. So what would you do? I went to what made me feel good, and that's what I did. As time went on, it got worse, and it got worse. To a point, I believe I was telling you when I was working with your daughter, I got up to 15 shots of vodka a day to survive. Dealing with patients as an optician, none of my patients were able to pick up on it because... Uh, vodka is, you don't smell it. And I was doing that. But I was miserable. My wife will tell you how miserable I was. I tried to play it off like I was this happy person. My life was in shambles. That seed that was planted in 1981 didn't get the water it needed to harvest, to grow, like any flower. So 19, excuse me, 2013, I came home from Manhattan one day sitting on the train, drinking, having a good old time. Came home, and my wife for years knew that I was drinking, but I, you know, I played it, I thought I had everybody fooled, so I played it off, and she wouldn't let me in the house anymore. This was in 2013. She said the dogs in the backyard or in the back room sleep with them, and that's exactly where I ended up. It was then, people call me crazy when I tell them, I felt like I was inside of a bottle and God put a rope through the neck and said, it's time for you to come and start getting that seed to harvest. The water just came streaming down, and I started to harvest. He pulled me right out of the bottle. Hence, Bottoms Up, the book that I started writing. But I will tell you this. God can pull you out of anything, but it takes you. It takes you to, to do everything that you need to do to continue on the path of glory. It's not just something that God's going to say, okay, got you where you have to be, now you just sit there and I'll do the rest, because you have to put the work in it. 
Because nothing is impossible, like that song says. And it is possible to do anything in life, but you have to give it to work. And to this day, I am still learning about the Lord. Although my mother, um, like I said, she, she put a lot into us in, in raising us to, 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 to be believers. But in 2016, my mother was killed in Shirley. She was hit by a driver. And I truly believe that's when my spirituality went into turbo charge. My mother, when she was laying on William Floyd Parkway with a tarp over her, I believe if she could have said to me, forgive the person that did this, she would have. Amen. Yeah. How many of us can actually forgive somebody for taking somebody? I mean, the Bible says we only can't forgive. We cannot dish out punishment. And what better way to forgive and release that frustration, that hate that was building up for the person that did this to me than to get contact the person and say, I forgive you. Right. And, I, and I know there are other people that probably would have done the same, but for me, hardcore Marine, hardcore alcoholic, miserable person most of my life, that was the hardest thing for me to do, but when I did it, I felt like a brand new person. And I am telling everyone that if you just keep going at what you're doing in life and you don't ever quit, things do change. So in 2016 is when I turbocharged my spirituality. And I started helping people throughout the country. Could be homeless shelters, jails, it could be hospitals. And just that one smile to a total stranger makes such a difference in anybody's life. Just that arm of extent, or arms of extension, just to say, I'm here for you, makes a difference in people's lives. These are the things that I wasn't able to get because they were out there, but I didn't take it. And, and, and we all in life can do so much more for each other if we just follow the one rule, and that is to obey God, and to love God, and to always count on God, no matter what. I have to tell you a quick story of what happened to me. My wife and I, we moved down to Virginia, but first, before we did, I went for an interview at a hospital down there as an optician. I got a great job in the hospital. Manager optician in charge of 14 people. Went down, we moved down there. Great paying job. Man gives me money, isn't that great, right? We go down there, so it was Christmas Eve. No, New Year's Eve, I wrote an email to my subordinates, and I said, may God walk with you, may God be with you in 2018. I walked in June, uh, January 3rd. I got written up for that, and that they took three months of compensation from me for using the word God. Here's the kicker. The same person that wrote me up thanked me when I wrote an email to him when his father died. He said, you're always so inspirational four months prior to that but he wrote me up for that. I let it go for three weeks. It was eaten up inside me. I couldn't deal with patience. I, picture this. You're told you can't speak of God. It was eaten away at me. My wife, I finally admit to my wife what, I, what happened. I was still working for the company. I was just going to go full force, but I knew that God was standing in front of me saying, you need to make a decision that's either going to be me or it's going to be this man-made, money-giving company. I stood there, gave my three-week notice. On my last day, I went in front of the camera, for anyone that knows me here knows that I, I do a couple of videos here and there. I went in front of the camera and I said, God has my back. Here I am with bills, no money, but I said on camera, God had my back. Amen. And the next day, God had my back. I get a phone call from Alaska, from the VA hospital, Prism Optical, that I used to work for when I was young and I was able to go to Alaska. I'm getting a little old for that now. He said, Ralph, we heard that you're no longer working for Virginia Eye Institute. How would you like to work from home and do all the Eskimos eyeglasses for Medicaid from your own house? Now, if you tell me that that's not God, I want to sell you anything because you'll probably buy it. You might even buy my books then. 
Because that was God in work. I said the day before, God had my back. And I'll tell you this right now. My wife and I, we constantly run into stumbles and blocks and this and that. But you know what? I don't let these things bother me anymore. Because when God, in 2016, when my mother passed, and, and that spirituality double kicked, triple kicked within me, I knew then that no matter what, as long as I obey and I let that seed harvest, that harvest is God's work for me in my life. And that's the absolute written, as Samantha said, in rock. Because if you truly, truly trust in God, there is nothing that man-made decisions or anything can take away from you. Because even if somebody took my life, God has my back. And that's, that's really what it came down to. So I left there, and, and I was slightly depressed because... Bills were piling up because even what, what God provided for me, you know, you're talking paychecks take time. But suddenly, another place called me. And it was working across the street from my house for the county. So here we are today, and I have two positions, and I'm still able to do 10 different podcasts, 2,700 videos on the Take Your Life Back Today show to sign. Is it still up there? It fell. Oh, it fell. Okay. And I'm able to do all that, but when I worked at Virginia Eye Institute under a company that said, no, you can't talk about God. And mind you, they had Bibles in their waiting room. Mm -hmm. Go figure that one out, right? But these are the little things that we take for granted, but you have to stand firm in your... You know, my mother, when, when we were young, my mother showed me a, a film. Some of you might have seen it where Christians were lined up walking to the guillotine. Unless they said, we're not Christians, their head was going to be chopped off. Have anybody ever seen that Christian video? Yeah. That's what I felt like that day. I felt as my head was chopped off when I gave that notice. I felt like a failure. But in God's eye, I was his child. In God's eye, he said, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. Because if you don't trust in God and you think you have it, like I used to say, God, I have this, don't worry about it. You'll end up exactly where I was. So if you don't let that seed harvest, and that seed could be as old as, in my case, 1981. That's an old seed, isn't it? It's not as old as me, but it's old. But if you water it, and when I say water, I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about reading the Bible. Yeah. You know, I, I came up with this whole thing here to talk about today. You see this? All this? I really want to talk about a lot of stuff here today. But I truly believe when you talk from the heart, too, yeah. it makes a big difference. Right. I can sit here and read a lot of this stuff. I mean, there's definitely stuff I do want to talk about. But when you talk from the heart and you tell your story and you let people know that nothing... Nothing is impossible in life. And I know for a fact, every single person here has a struggle. Everyone. I'm, I'm not talking about alcohol, drugs. I'm talking about there is a struggle. But God will never give you anything that you cannot handle in life. Because God is just preparing you for the next step for something to make you stronger for the next thing in life. Now, if you struggle and you fail because, I, because that's what you wanted, it's because you didn't turn to God and say, God, I need help. And, you know, God is not on demand it's as such as you only go to him when you're in dire need. But the rest of the time you're like, yeah, I don't need you. It's either you are with God or you're not with God. I was not with God. I was only with God when I needed him, when I was in trouble, when I had a run. That's when I turned to God. But that's not, that's not being a full-time Christian. That's being using God on demand. And, and, and that's what it really comes down to. And, you know, I want to talk about something here. Has anybody ever heard about the interview with God? No? I recently came across this, and it, it kind of made me think on, can you imagine if you could talk to God and just ask God questions? How, how many of us would love to do that? I would. I would love to ask God. Of course, I'd probably bore him because I have so many questions. So Some of these questions... I dream I had an interview with God. So you would like to interview me, God said. That is pretty interesting. I said, well, if you have time, God. God smilingly says, time, that's my eternity. 
What questions do you have for me? I said, what surprises me, uh, you most about human mankind, about us? And God answered, that they get bored with childhood, that they rush to grow up, and then they long to be children again. How true is that? How many of us wish we can go back in time and change things from our past, be young again, change some of the people in our lives, right? So, God also said that they lose their health to make money and then lose their money to restore their health. How? That's, that's unbelievable, right? But that's what God says. That by thinking anxiously about the future, they forget the present, which we're going to talk about it in a minute. We're, we're going to talk about how we need to eliminate the past and move from the present into the future. That they live as they would never die and die as though they had never lived. That's what God would say if you interviewed him. God's hand took mine, and we were silent for a while. And then I asked, as a parent, what are some life's lessons you want your children to learn? God replied, to learn they cannot make anyone love them. A lot of us know that, right? All they can do is let themselves be loved. To learn that it's not good to compare themselves to others. How many times do we look at our neighbors and we say, wow, Mercedes, and you look at your Fiat in your driveway, right? <laughs> to, to learn to forgive by practicing forgiveness. I mean, forgiveness, that's, that's tough. Especially when a life is taken. To learn that it only takes a few seconds to open profound wounds and those they love and it can take many years to heal those wounds. Things said, how many times do we say things that a day, a week, a year, we, we just, we say, God, we wish we'd have never said that, right? But you can't take words back. And those words will stick with people forever. To learn that a rich person is not one who has most, but is one who needs the least. To learn that there are people who love them dearly, but simply do not know how to express their sh of feelings for love. To learn that two people can look at the same thing and see things totally different. Yeah. And this just goes on and on, but the reason I brought this up is because can you imagine, and all of us that truly obey God and, and, and live a Christian life, we're going to be standing in front of God. So keep some of these questions in your mind because maybe one day we can interview God while we're up there. Wouldn't that be a great interview? <laughs> Put on Showtime or HBO or something? That'd be really neat, right? So 2016 came, and I started the life coaching, and I started the addiction recovery coaching. And we have a hotline, and we, we get phone calls at 1, 2 in the morning. People, suicidal. And this is only my wife and I that deal with all this. From all over the country. Some of my biggest audience are from Alaska and Asia, and I don't know if I can understand Alaska being I've worked up there for many years, but Asia. And we get those phone calls, and those phone calls, the words that I say over the phone to these folks can either make them or break them. And I always turn to God, not during the phone call, but in my mind during the phone call. In other Amen. words, I don't say anything to them because one thing I've learned that you have to watch every word you say when you're talking to someone that has a gun to their head, that is maybe on the verge of ODing. Mm -hmm. My job is just to hold them over to get the proper help for them. And that's what we've been doing with the life coaching and the addiction recovery coaching. I want everyone to know that at one point in my life, this is not what you would see. What you would see is a man laying there in a fetal position passed out, drunk, didn't care about anything. If we had five dollars, four dollars went to my alcohol. A dollar for bread, milk, make it happen, I don't care. My alcohol was more important. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So when, when, when we stand up and we start harvesting that seed that God had put wherever we are, and, and we start flourishing and, 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 and becoming 
larger and larger in our own lives, it's now up to us, the person that's actually flourishing, to actually reach out to other people. And I truly believe that each and every one of us is here on earth for a reason, and it's to connect. And I always say it's a paper doll effect. You know the paper dolls? Mm -hmm. That we all somehow connect? Mm -hmm. Look at how this full circle came. 40 years I've left yeah. here from East and Left Ward. Here I am, 40 years, almost to the month when I left to talk about how terrible my life has been in the last 40 years. You guys miss me? No. It's been a terrible life, right? But I promise you this, the last six, six and a half years, although Christian upbringing, although proper educating from parents and other people, it didn't matter to me. But the last six years is when God took over my life. No parent can do that for you. No sister, no brother. God took over my life and he has my back because he will not let me struggle without making me stronger. Amen. There are times where I feel weak at decisions, but that's when I turn to my father, the Lord. Because I know, and you know, there'll be times where I think he's letting me down, but that's because he won't answer when you want him to answer. He will only answer when he feels the time is right. That's when he'll answer. And I know for a fact that without the Lord Jesus Christ in my life, my wife, she wouldn't have a husband because I'd be dead. Right. Well, she might have a husband, but it won't be me. <laughs> what a sense of humor, right? No, but but that's, that's the God's honest truth of it. If she should thank anyone, it shouldn't be me for changing. It should be God for being in my life. Because I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. All I did was say, yes, Jesus, right. come into my heart. That's, right. that's all I had to do. But that's not the only thing I have to do in the years to come, the weeks to come, the year, the minutes, whatever. I have to continue, almost like when I'm an optician, I have to continue to educate myself. Every year I have to take 12 college credits. I have to continue to educate myself. And I'm not that great with the Bible. I'm not. I don't like to read a lot. I'm more of a visual person. But I have to continuously feed, water this seed to keep harvesting in, within me. I have to do that. And we all have to do that in life. And, and if, even if it's not for some people with Christ, it's with anything you do in life. If you don't follow through, it falls apart. We all have to just keep moving forward. And, and, and in my case, and many I'm sure here, is to keep watering that seed. I mean, if you really think about it, how, how, how many people here can really say they know what that seed is and, and how that seed is flourishing in their lives? Because if I would have sat there six years ago, I would have been like, oh, seed, what are you talking about? Seed, what, in my garden? <laughs> But that's the truth. Because it doesn't, it didn't make sense to me. I've heard it before. I've heard, I used to sit in church and hear it all the time, but you know, one ear and out the other. But when you do have that seed, you know exactly what I'm talking about then. When you have that seed, you know that no matter what, at the end of the day, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're sick or, health, uh, or healthy, that God has your back. And when my time comes, I know God is doing that for a reason. When my time comes to go to heaven, it's because that's what God said. It's your time to go to heaven. I don't get to pick and choose those things. So what does it mean to be a, a, a man of God or a godly man? Well, there's a lot of definitions. It probably depends on who you ask and, and uh, their unique um, perception. Some would say that being a man of God doesn't sound like very much fun, while others could be consider a man of this caliber to be utterly weak. You're a man of God? You're a weak person. You don't want to be macho, like the village people or something, you know? No, but seriously, think about it. Like if somebody in the bar, hi, I'm Ralph, I'm a man of God. All right. So what does that mean? I have personally, I have personally lived a split rail. I chose to pick God on demand, like I said, when I needed him. How convenient, right? How many of us go to our parents when we need something, and the rest of the time you're like, but that's the same thing. We only go when we have that self-gratification, when we get something out of it. 
I was a Christian part of the time, most of my adult life, up the part when I needed. So I was a self-proclaimed Christian, but I wasn't a Christian. Because I felt that if I go to the proper channels and I said, I'm a Christian, can you give me five bucks? I would get the five dollars and then go and take it right to the liquor shop. That is a part-time Christian. That is not a, a Christian. It's a split rail. It's that fork in the road. I was open about my faith when I asked and tried to live according to God's word each day, but in reality, I separated God from my life. How convenient, right? Depending on where I was, who I was talking to. I went about my day-to-day -day business using God when I needed him and leaving him out when it wasn't convenient for me. This double character of existence caused internal issues within me. Now, I'm reading this because this is in my book. So I'm giving you folks some little insights in my book so you get to see what the book is really about. I went on like this for many years thinking that nothing was wrong with me. Ultimately, I was forced to examine my life through self-introspection. You see, time after time, I was either partially right or completely wrong. But because of the way I handle it, I was typically wrong all the time, even though I thought I was right. See, I, I really, truly think that I'm right a lot, but I'm always wrong. Anybody have that problem? No? What am I, the only human here? <laughs> Seriously, nobody, nobody has that problem? Wow, I feel bad. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm going to go hide now. You know, everybody says, Ralph, you're so transparent. Why do you talk so bad about yourself? Because it's the truth. Because if I can talk this way about myself, maybe I'll give you an open chance to maybe relieve some of that insight and, and talk to people. Because my struggles help other people. I was saying to someone over there, we were talking about life coaching, and someone had said, well, how did you do it without AA and, and rehab? And I said, because when you help people, you help yourself. Think about that. When I help a person that has an addiction problem, when I help, help a person with depression, self-esteem issues, I help myself. That's right. yeah. And it's a reward that cannot be taken from you. That's right. When I get those phone calls, I know that person is going to hang up and possibly have a tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Now, of course, God decides that or not. But I was merely that bridge to help that person. And all I did was give a lending ear wow. and some advice. <clears throat> so six years ago, I committed myself to focusing on what it would uh, take to become a true man of God. Now I'm going, I'm not going to lie to you, it has been hard. It's a rough road and it still is every single day. Sometimes I find myself in my old habits, and I'm not talking about it drinking, I'm just talking about it as a regular, compared to, as a regular human, as we all are, we find ourselves angry. We find ourselves wanting to yell, scream. There's no way you guys can tell me I'm the only one again. Oh, okay. Because I'm ready to give up then. So how did I start trying to be a man of God? And why is that so important today? First, let's address the concerns I had about becoming a man of God. These thoughts kept me at bay for years, and in hindsight, they were weak, but at the time... They were like very large mountains in front of me. My first thought was that it was going to be quite embarrassing to tell my family I hadn't been the man of God I was supposed to be. Because my mom, in front of my mom, I always pretended to be a better person than I really am, was. Now she would probably love me a lot. No, she wouldn't love me. She would love to see the results of me. But in front of her, I would pretend that I was this... Not a Christian, but a much better person. You know, it's almost like being an actor. You, you play the roles with different people. My f first thought was that it was going to be quite embarrassing to tell my family, like I just said. This was a huge stumbling block for me, even though my family had established a good relationship. My pride was very strong. And I showed weaknesses, and I wouldn't be a man's man if I didn't show weaknesses. Looking back... That was a weak excuse. There's no other way to put it. As for family, my wife is my partner, a relationship established by God. Remember I told you I picked my first wife, God picked my second? Because I truly believe there is a husband and a wife for every person that I truly believe that God 
picks for you. But God will allow you to make the decision. And if it works out, that's great. But when you stumble and you fall, God will pick you up. And he, he sent Casey to me, who has made me not the Christian that I am, but has made me the man that she built me up to where I decided to, to, to turn my life to Jesus. She built me up because she kept me straight. Mm -hmm. Not with the alcohol, obviously. No. <laughs> but she kept me straight because she gave me tough love. Yeah. It's like a child. I was like a child. When you have children that constantly need to be disciplined, yeah. you need to show that tough love. And that's what she did. Because if she didn't do that, if she didn't kick me out of the house and have me sleep with the dogs, yeah. <laughs> it, it's the truth. I slept with the dogs. It was tough. They had a better sleep. They had a house to crawl into. I was on the floor with a blanket for a day and a half. Now everybody's looking at you like a mean person. <laughs> Do not let pride keep you from doing what you know is right. Remember I told you about Virginia Eye Institute. What was right for me to say is you will not tell me I can't talk of God. I did not send an email to customers. I sent it to my subordinates who loved my motivation and my spirituality all year round, but now... It wasn't good because there was probably one person in that 14 people that made a complaint. And that one complaint put this whole event in motion for me to be where I am today. And that was all written by God way before it even happened. My second thought was that giving control to God didn't sound like much fun. Have you ever thought about giving control to God and, and saying, well, how much fun can that really be? Putting God in front of myself and then and my wife in front of me just didn't sound like right because I would always come in third. Who wants to come in third? I want to be first. But you have to put God, then you put your wife, and then you put yourself. Now, a lot of men have gone, probably agree with me on this, but that is, I believe, how it should be. God, wife, man. Now, a lot of wives will agree with that, but what about the men? The men, I truly believe, it works for me. Because if I would have done the other way, me, my wife, and God, where was I? On the floor with the dogs. Let's say, all right, my wife, God, me, still would have been on the floors, on the floor. I guarantee you right now, my wife would never even imagine me laying on the floor ever again. That's the way it is. If you do the math, that meant I would always be in third. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I have an ego problem. I like coming in first. It must be the sports from the past and all that. Marines, Marines never want to come in last. As a man, I've come to realize that I'm naturally an arrogant, prideful, and self-centered person who can easily only care about himself. But what, what honestly did that get me in the past? Nothing. Struggles. And those struggles continuously made me stronger and continuously kept me going. My life would have been miserable as it was, and nothing more than that. Is anyone like that in this current situation like that? No. Yeah. Are you? <laughs> Call me. <laughs> I do pro bono. Everything's pro bono. So you don't have to worry about press. My third <clears throat> thought was it was going to be difficult to keep up a self-discipline to read the Bible daily. Now remember I said I'm not a reader. I don't like to read a lot. Even all the newspaper clippings throughout the nation that I've been in, I don't like to read them because they always misquote you, they say something. So I, and I find it very hard to read the Bible, and that's why the audio Bible works really good. Have you, have you seen that? Or the visual ones on TV that you can see? I think I have a, an attention span of an ant. <laughs> These all were legitimate fears and worries that required both, both honesty and humbleness over the time that came. Over time, reading the Bible daily and learning by God has become an enjoyable task for the time that I could spend reading the Bible. It's comforting to know you can talk and pray with God about anything at any time, and it's been life-changing, and it's working for me. And in uh, full disclosure... Um, I think any person that turns to the Bible will find it. it is a book that tells you everything you need to know in life. Amen. Everything from start to finish. Or what's the old saying in the 70s? From soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's so true. And, you know, recently I think we were, I was talking to somebody who you know, was saying, well, 
I think it was down in Virginia. Down here, everybody's Baptist. <laughs> Baseball teams, right? We all have a lot of teams, but they're shooting for one thing, and that's what's it called, the pennant? But don't you honestly feel, as long as you shoot to become a child of God and shoot for going to heaven, what difference does it make what you have to call somebody? I mean, you have to say to somebody, oh, well, huh, you're this, you're that. That makes you better, worse. We can't do that. That's the problem is we're labeling so much in life. Reflecting on the rich person who has everything but couldn't buy health or time extended. These were his last words. Listen to these words. In other eyes, my life is an essence of success, but aside from work, I have little joy and in the end, wealth is just a fact of life to which I was accustomed to. All the money in the world this guy had. At this moment, lying on bed, sick and remembering all my life, I realized that all my recognition of wealth that I have is meaningless in the face of imminent death. You can hire someone to drive a car for you, make money for you, but you cannot rent somebody to carry disease for you. Think about that. Amen. One can find material things, but there is one thing that cannot be found when it is lost, and that is life. And life is so precious. Every single day, we are blessed with 86,400 seconds of life. Every time you open your eyes. How many seconds do we thank God out of those 86,400 seconds? For some, it might be 10 seconds. For some, 30 but think about it, 86,400 seconds. Those are a lot of seconds. And, and how many of those seconds do we use to make a difference in somebody's life? Or are we all selfish enough to use that, absorb that 86,400 seconds? And then at the end of the day, we have maybe 3,000 left over, those seconds. Well, what are you going to do with those 3,000? Because you can't carry them over to the next day. Because the next day, if God allows you to wake up, he's given you 86,400 seconds again. So why don't we use some of those seconds to make a difference in other people's lives? Mm, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I talked about a thing. We all love emails, right? Well, especially me. I got written up for one. <laughs> And my wife rolls her eyes when I, when I talk about this because I, she hears me doing it all day. I love knee mail. We all go to bed at night and we take our slippers off. I'm not taking mine off because I've been in these shoes all day. And we got to put our slippers by the ledge of our bed, right? Yeah. Kick them under your bed. Kick them under your bed tonight. Yeah. That way, in t the tomorrow morning when you wake up, uh, yeah. oh, where are those? <laughs> there they are. And while you're under there, an email. Yeah. That is your direct communication to God. We don't need wireless. Come on, come on. What, what's, a, what's the other stuff? Wireless, is all these other things. We don't need that because an email, Nemail will be heard by God no matter where you are. You can go use Nemail in the bathroom. You could use it wherever you are. So I believe the 86,400 second God gives us each and every day, if you even pocket 20 of those seconds at night, you wasted God's precious time he gave you. You wasted it. Can you imagine if you got $86,400 every day and God said you have to spend it and you can't carry it over? I bet you you'd, you'd find a way to spend that, wouldn't you? Well, why can't we do that with the precious time God gives us every day? If you don't have, if you don't want to use the time on, on, on yourself, use it on someone here. Make a difference in somebody's life. It doesn't take a lot to, to, to tell somebody, hey, listen, God loves you. I love you. Treat yourself well, this dying man said. He said, treat yourself well and cherish others. As we get older, we are smarter. And we slowly realize that the watch is worth $30 or $300, both of which both tell the same time. It's not about materialistic things. Me, personally, if I could shop, I would buy the cheapest of everything. I go to, we went to McDonald's. I want the dollar menu. I'll go to 
Kmart, or whatever, and look for the cheapest stuff. Whether we carry a purse worth thirty dollars or three hundred, the amount of money in the wallet is still the same. Whether we drive a car worth one hundred and fifty thousand, I would love that, or a car worth thirty thousand, the road and the distance are the same. We reach the same destination. We drink a bottle of wine worth three hundred dollars or worth ten dollars. The effect is still the same. If a house we live in is 300 square feet, or 3,000 square feet, which I would love, the loneliness without God is still the same. Amen. Without God, you can have the mansion. Look at, look, at, look at people from Hollywood. How many unhappy people, and they have everything. We would love to have 10%, 1% of what they have. Your true inner happiness does not come from material, uh, uh, material things in this world. Whether you're flying first class or economy class, if the plane crashes, you crash with it. So I hope you understand that when you have friends or someone to talk to, this, this, a family of God is true happiness. Amen. It doesn't cost us anything to turn around and say, hi, how you doing? Is there anything I could do to help you? Of course, we all have limitations when it comes to that. Somebody says to me, I need $100. Well, I can help you with a smile. <laughs> Here are five undeniable facts of life. Do not educate your children to be rich. Amen. Educate them to be happy. Jesus. So when they grow up, they will know that the value of things, not the price of things. Eat your food as medicine, otherwise you will need to eat your medicine as food. Come on. Ooh, that's a good word. <laughs> Whoever loves you will never leave you, even if he or she has a hundred reasons, my wife, to give up on you. He or she will always find one reason, that's all you need, one reason to hold on to that loved one. Not to give up on that loved one. There's a big difference between being a human and being a human being. If you want to go fast, you're going to go alone in life. But if you want to go far, we need to go together. As a family, not just of God, but as a family in society. And in conclusion, not of my speech, it's just what this, I'm just reading what this says. The six, I don't want everybody's like, hey, whoa, 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 shortcuts. The six best doctors in the world for you and your health are these doctors. Maybe some of you guys have heard of these doctors. Sunlight. Mm -hmm. Rest. This one, I don't... Let me hide my stomach. Exercise. <laughs> Diet. Yes. Self-confidence. And friends. True friends. And the only way to make new friends is by lending a helping hand. Keep them in all stages of your life and enjoy a happy and not a lonely life and include God. Love the people God sent you. One day he'll need them back. And as Esther and I, Mary Ann, being that it was on mine, we know that. How quick a person can just leave this earth. We spoke about the bank account, so unless somebody wants to make a deposit, $86,400. <laughs> find somebody to be good. Just find somebody to be good to every single day. I wonder what our world would be like if each of us would find somebody to be good to every day. I know for a fact that I, at least once a day, can help one person. As simple as just saying to your spouse, I love you, great job, to your children, to your neighbor. I always say in my shows to go to that elderly person and help them with a garbage can. You see that poor lady dragging the garbage can? Just help them. Because when you help them, you helped yourself. And when you help somebody, you are lending God, you are lending God... Something where he can pay you back with it. So when you're helping somebody with something so minimal, he's going to give it back to you so big. 
Can you imagine helping somebody and then looking around and saying to yourself, I made a difference in this world. I think I was just talking, I think it was Roddy. I said, every day, try to make a difference in your world. And I was talking about myself. Every day I think, how can I make a difference? And it's only in the last year when people have now started seeing my videos a lot more. And every single day I get those emails and they encourage me. It just keeps me going. It keeps me, uh, especially when it comes to the Bible videos. Like this one, where I think it was Eugene, right? We were talking about uh, the Bible and narcissism. I've gotten so many replies and about 10% of, uh, of them were really bad towards me about it. But that's just the devil fighting what I had to say. That's all it is. Scripture teaches every opportunity we have, we should do good for people. It's in the Bible. And this is for somebody that doesn't get to read a lot of it. That means we need to be on the lookout. We need to be proactive. We need to have the mindset of, who can I bless today? For whom can I do a favor today? We all have plans. We all have our own lives to run. But we need to start reaching out to each other because that's what God is directing us to do. Recently I heard stories from other people how they're helping people they don't even know. And that's good to hear when you hear that. People you don't even know. People that might be being outcasted by society, these people are helping this particular person that's outcasted by society. They will be rewarded. Maybe not now. But they are already rewarded because they have Christ in them. I always say never, ever, ever give up in anything you do. It's never too late to, although it seems like life is a struggle. And, and honestly, life is a struggle for me every single day. I don't think there's any, not one Christian that can't say they don't struggle. Because I know I do. And it could be simply dealing with a client. It could be dealing with a job. It could be... Maybe I got my wife mad and I shouldn't have said something like, those are all struggles, but you can get over them because life is a struggle. Life will throw curveballs at you. It will humble you. It will attempt to break you. And just when you think things are starting to look up, life will smack you right back down and you're starting again. And that's when you need to do and utilize an email and turn to God and say, what do I need to do to fix whatever I might have caused, whatever I might have done, or what do I need to do to change myself? The reason most people never achieve their dreams is because they simply give up. They quit. And when you quit, the failure alone makes you miserable. Life was never meant to be easy. It never was meant to. God purposely gives us struggles each and every day to strengthen us for the next step in life. Because if God gave you something to do and you just breeze through it, what if once something happens terrible, how are you going to deal with it? How will you deal with it? Every single struggle I have faced in life either smacked me so hard across the face that I had to be punished for it in many different ways, or when I turned my life to Jesus, where I relied on him to bail me out, but not on demand. Not on demand. I had to put the work into it. I had to be patient, which a lot of us aren't, because I'm not a patient person. When God feels he's going to answer you, when God feels he's going to come to you and, and help you, that's when it's going to happen. In the meantime, you just stay idle. You wait. What time did I start? Anybody know? I still have a little bit of time, right? Yes. Okay, well, I'll get through this. I think I'm close to an hour. Well, you all just heard about my life. You're probably saying, boy, we used to like him. <laughs> I hope that you, every single person is inspired enough for my struggles to appreciate your own struggles. Because I'm here to tell you that my struggles are, are, are bad. And I'm sure everybody's had struggles, but if you could see that you can come out of any struggle in life and anything that you tackle in life and you never give up, you will honestly be a winner, but you will only win when you allow God in your life. When you allow God to be part of your team, yeah. our team, yeah. 
But if you're like I was and say, God, I got this. And, you know, you ever see the kids? Hey, I got this. It, you, you don't have it. Believe me, you don't have it. You're fooling yourself. When you look in the mirror, how many times have you folks looked in the mirror and you were so disgusted with what you saw? I know I was many times. Because you can't love any person if you don't love yourself. Come on, that's right. And when I looked in the mirror during those drunk days, what I saw was a miserable person that didn't even want to exist anymore. We can either fight our struggles, we can embrace the reality of them and ask God to work through our struggles. I'm learning to embrace the reality of it. I accept every single struggle that comes my way, acknowledge my real life, my real season of my life. Our lives are like seasons. Even if it's not what I want it to look like. What I've learned is that we don't have to love our circumstances, but we can love how God grows us through our circumstances. This is truth that we find in Romans 5, 3, 4. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces the four-letter word that we all need in life, and that's hope. That's what character builds, hope. Without hope, we have nothing to look forward to. Yep. There is no growth without struggle. So I can love my struggles because I know that they are strengthening my faith and maturing me in unique, different ways for that seed to blossom into the flower that God's creating within me. Right now, God is using my gaps to learn to give myself and others more grace. Let my struggles help others realize that it is never too late to change. Listen, I didn't change until I was 51. I'm 57 now? Yeah, 51. So it's never too late. So if you're 40 and you say, ah, oh, half my life is shot, you're, you're right about that. But what about the other half? You still have a... You still have a half a glass in that half empty glass. Utilize it with God. Let my struggles help you realize that. For anyone that will read my book, it's the type of book that you don't want to just put away when you're done with it. Give it to someone because my struggles, your struggles, can help other people's struggles. Can your love, st struggling with other people, possibly help yourself? In other words, if you see somebody struggling, can that really help yourself by helping them? Because this whole thing that I'm talking about is, is all of us helping each other, struggling with each other. My struggle shouldn't be just for me to isolate it between me and God. I want to bring my struggles to you because they will help you. They absolutely will help you. And, and I'm going to get the roll of the eyes now because I need to just bring this up real quick. You ever wonder why a car has a really big windshield? You ever wonder? Why is that? Because we need to see what's coming ahead of us, right? You ever notice we have a little rear view mirror? And we kind of drive, we look in that rear view mirror. It doesn't matter, it's behind you. Every one of us here has a past. Every one of us. Now, if you're in this room, you obviously haven't done something bad enough to get a life sentence somewhere. Because you're here. <laughs> But we all have a past. But why is it that some people always talk about the past? Yeah. Why is it that some people don't care what's happening here today and That's what's right. going to happen tomorrow? Because yeah. right. God knows what's going to happen to us. God knows when we're going to die. He has a date set already. Yep. I just don't want to know mine because I'll sit there and worry about it the whole time. <laughs> but there's a reason that the windshield's in a car so big compared to that rearview mirror because it don't matter what's behind you. Right. It really doesn't. And I, and I hope that my struggles really inspire people enough to maybe take a good look at yourselves and say, listen, if he could do it, he sounded real bad. If he could do it, then I could do it. And, you know, usually when I do my speeches, I, I always want to ask people if they have any questions because and, and, and there's not one question that you can ask me I won't honestly answer you because I, I live my life very transparent and I do it on my videos and... There's nothing that you can't ask me about me, my past, or my future. I can't tell you about my future, but you can ask me. <laughs> Any questions? That is good. That is good. Well, I, I planned on doing this a lot more, but you know, 
I tru truly believe that God wants me to talk from my heart more.